This is the SFF Audio Podcast. I'm Scott. And this is Jesse. What's going on this week? Uh, we're going to talk to, hopefully, we're going to talk to James Powell, Canadian American science fiction writer. He's Canadian living in the United States. Um, I say science fiction writer, but really he's a crime writer, a mystery writer, who writes science fiction, fantasy stories, and uh, mostly mysteries. It's uh, um, pleasure to meet you over uh, the telephone. Yes, it is a pleasure for me to hear your voice. Oh, thank you very much. Um, I wanted to uh, let you know I've, I've uh, given Scott a couple of stories to listen to uh, of yours, and um, I want to chat with you today because uh, you're one of my favorite authors. Thank you very much. Did you get the uh, story I sent you? It hasn't, hasn't arrived yet, but um, oh, I, I'm that. eagerly awaiting, awaiting it. Yes. I, I, I I don't remember if you sent it to me or if I I must have got it in the in the issue I think uh, previous story uh, I guess it was a couple years ago in Ellery Queens I think it was um, and that was the Halloween one you know the uh, one yes. I mean a, yes a cozy for the jack o' lanterns that's it yeah exactly yeah. I sent um, you that with the uh, the second uh, Bozo story, the second Clarentown story. Right, right. Uh, maybe that was my that. email. Mm-hmm. Oh, cool. That's, Very that's cool. Terrific. So there's more than one Clarentown story. I, I heard my first Clarentown story uh, just last night. Uh, yes, there is more. There, there is, as a matter of fact. I, uh, when I wrote the first one, it was uh, 89 or 90, I think. 89. Uh, one, of the edit- <clears throat> one of the editors said... Uh, are you going to write any more? And I said, no, I think I've done about all the clown stories I put into one package. But then a couple, uh, two or three years ago, I got an idea for another. And now I think I've got just the germ, the germ of an idea for a third one. Oh, terrific. But we'll see what happens. Yeah, the story, the name of the story um, is A Dirge for Clown Town. Um, yes. And that was the, the first one, correct? That's right. And the the second one is being published uh, now, or is it's that what published? It's in the February issue, I believe, of Ellery Queen, and it's called Clown Town Pajamas. Oh wow! Well, it's a, and that's on stands now. Like uh, it's available now to be purchased uh, in your good bookstores. As far as I know, uh, you yep. have to you have to ask for them. I think mostly they're not on the newsstands the way they used to be. No, that and that's really thing. unfortunate, but. Yeah. Um, I, I've seen Ellery Queen on, on my local bookstore uh, news rack, but they they bring in like three copies. So if you if you're not subscribed, they can be hard to get. Yes, uh, subscriptions are probably the best way of doing it. Someone once told me that if you went to a uh, a bookstore in a hospital or a newsstand in a hospital, you could sometimes find it. Hmm. No, I never uh, even thought about that, but that makes total sense. Yeah. Um, I've seen them all over, uh, you know, sort of the bookshelves of libraries and uh, hospital libraries. Yeah. yeah Actually, I got I got into Ellery Queen magazine when I was a kid. My grandfather was a big fan of mystery mystery mags, and he had mm-hmm. um, Ellery Queen and Alfred Hitchcock magazine and a few others, and he had a huge paperback collection too. So that's how I got first into mysteries. I didn't really uh, intend to write mysteries. I, uh, the first story that I had published uh, was based on a story somebody had told me. It was a special police force in Monaco who watched the uh, gambling tables. And if they <laughs> saw somebody who looked like he was going to commit suicide, they would uh, <laughs> give, him t- give him a train ticket out of town and a couple of bucks. Oh my God. Because they didn't want to become the suicide capital of the world. Right. So when I, I, I decided that would make a very good story, and uh, I worked on it for a while. Uh, and as a matter of fact, it sort of, you might say that it contributed to my whole concept of writing, because uh, by the time I got around to writing it, I was living in New York, and uh, 
I had only spent one afternoon in Monte Carlo, or Monaco, and I was very vague about what I saw, and I was nervous about writing about something I didn't know that much about. So I invented my own little principality in the south of France. And that's where yeah, I I've the been story. reading about that series on your, your website, and I've never actually mm -hmm. seen a copy of, of that series. Um, it looks to me like you haven't had like enough anthologies uh, of uh, your stuff recently out there. Um, no. Actually, and that's there will be an anthology. For... Mm -hmm. Sorry, continue. Uh, yeah. uh, there will be an anthology think. sometime. At the moment, uh, Crippen and Landrew, I don't know whether you know them or not, but they're a mm -hmm. publishing house that publishes mystery stories. Mm -hmm. They are going to do uh, an anthology of mine called a pocket full of noses, and uh, a pocket full of noses, I believe it's called stories of one uh, Ambrose Ganelon or another. I created right. a family of four detectives, all named Ambrose Ganelon, and I advise anybody to, who thinks they might like to do something like that not to do it, <laughs> because you always have to describe everybody when you, and it's very hard to keep them separate. But in any event, uh, this first story was called The Friends of Hector Jouvet, and I set it in this little principality that I had to invent. And it was rejected, I sent it around, it was rejected 17 times, I believe, till it was finally appeared in L. Lily Queen Mystery Magazine. I didn't intend to write mystery stories, but that, it's a, it's a, a great um, liberation when you suddenly find there's somebody out there that wants to publish what you print. What you Absolutely. Mm -hmm. uh, that's actually on your website, that story, too. I'm sorry, I, I didn't quite hear that. I was saying uh, the Friends of Hector Jouvet is actually on your website. Is it? That's good. Yeah, yeah. for reading. And um, I, was, um, I was curious as to, uh, with, with the collection uh, Cold Blood, that's actually how I got introduced to you. Mm -hmm. um, uh, which was a collection of, I guess, uh, Canadian science fiction, uh, not science That's fiction, right. Canadian Peter mystery Sellers. stories. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that was like 1990 or so? Let's see, I, I have to get my file here. I've got a, I guess it was about 1990 when I come to it. Now, Peter Sellers, who edited that series, also edited my first collection. Uh, uh, a Murder uh, Coming. Uh, I might have come again. Mm -hmm. And I, that, that's this, actually the story that I got introduced to you with as well. Which one was that? Uh, a Murder Coming, the title story. A Murder Coming, okay, great. And um, I, didn't, I didn't connect um, the, two, uh, the two stories that I, I first came to read you uh, in until I put, put the fact that they're both sort of off-kilter, and I thought... James Powell, this is sort of an off-kilter story. Haven't I heard that name somewhere before? And I, I looked back, and yep, the, I've got two, two stories by James Powell. I wonder if it's the same guy, so I did a little research. And I think I ended up emailing you, uh, saying how much I enjoyed your, your writing. Actually, I, I recall, if I, if I recall correctly, you had mentioned uh, Clown Town, Bozo, in an article, a review that you, uh, right. audio review you did of uh, a book uh, whose title I don't recall. Yeah, and an unrelated uh, book. An unrelated book, yeah. And I uh, came across it. I did a uh, vanity Google, I think. <laughs> which I do, uh, on my that birthday, sounds right. And uh, I don't know, I was so pleased that you put me in such a nice context. You mentioned... Uh, Tolkien, I think, and uh, C.S. Lewis. Yeah, I, I remember it, what I was saying was um, there aren't that many original fantasy authors out there. Mm -hmm. And what you had done with Clown Town, uh, George from Clown Town, was create a completely original fantasy world um, like Tolkien had. Um, mm -hmm. Something that is not just a derivative of Tolkien or C.S. Lewis or or, you know, uh, an endless redo of something we've seen before. And um, in the collection that I, uh, I've got you on audio called um, 
uh, best fantasy stories of the year 1989, yes. um, Orson Scott Card's got a wonderful introduction saying basically exactly that, um, saying how original uh, the mystery, the mystery, the mystery is completely, you know, in a tradition, but the the fantasy elements are completely unprecedented. There's nothing like it. It's a complete yeah. world, and it's fully thought through. It's logical, and and yet completely original. And that that's kind of a shock. Well, I'm happy to hear you say that. Mm -hmm. he, uh, yeah, I got a uh, question for you. What what came first, the the mystery idea or the idea for Clown Town? I believe, uh, as far as that particular story goes, or in general. Uh, in uh, in that see. story, I guess. Is, uh, yeah, in, in that, that, that story. story, yeah, specifically. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, let's see. Um, I would have to say the world, mm -hmm. rather than the... I wasn't quite sure what the mystery would be. Uh, I knew that it, if there was going to be a murder in a clown context, one way to do it would be with a poison custard pie in the face. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and that sort of we st set off from there. I had to have a, uh, like a, the universe would be what a clown universe would be like, you know? The streets mm -hmm. would be named after circuses and kinds of circuses and the character, the uh, people would have names like, uh, uh, well, the town would be called Pratt Falls, that sort of thing. Right, yeah. The, the, I had that, the, by the way, in, uh, in my clown. I have Pratt Falls, and I also have Vaudevilleville. There's another little <laughs> village. Yeah. Uh, uh, I, I, I really love the, the naming scheme. It all, all makes sense. And I'm, I'm, I kept wondering, like, uh, how, how is it that I know so much about clowns that I can get this... Like there's so, there's you know, you had the hobo clowns and the rodeo clowns, and I was thinking, yeah, there are all those different kinds of clowns, and yet I'd never noticed this before. Yes, well, it is. It, it you just, uh, it's just a question of trying to flesh out what you're doing, your place, and uh, trying to imagine that kind of a universe. I suppose. I had an idea when I first started writing detective stories, and it really wasn't my field that I could do a great deal of fantasy in it, provided uh, I imposed rules on the scene. For example, I talk in, on my website about what I call elf economics. Mm -hmm. And that is essentially some way that you control magic so that it can be used in a mystery context. One story I wrote called uh, The Theft of the Fabulous Bird, you could have magical objects but you had to register them with the police. Mm -hmm. uh, much as guns had to be registered, that sort of thing. Or you, it's like uh, plain fair. Yeah, mm -hmm. in another story, uh, in another story, you can change things by magic, but you can only change them down, because obviously you can't, uh, you can't uh, let uh, a man who can change a cane into a dozen long stemmed roses which is a fine magical trick. He put all the forests out of business, you see. Right. So it can only, things can only be changed downward. Right. And that wasn't a bad idea. But again... No, it's uh, a great idea. Yeah. What story was, a, the, was that for? I'm sorry? Which story that was, was that for, one for? That was for Ellery Queen, and that was called... Let me think about it now. This may take a moment. Sure. Oh, uh, um, mid... Ah. Uh, Midnight Pumpkins, I think. Midnight oh, Pumpkins sounds... was a takeoff on Cinderella. Yeah, it sounds like it. That's great you could idea. take you could change a horse down to a, a, a mouse, or you could change a carriage to a pumpkin. That sort of thing. Was it the other way around? Uh, pumpkin, a carriage to a pumpkin. Yeah, but you can't turn a pumpkin into a carriage. Yeah, uh, I had a lot of fun with those stories, but they all weren't really the kind of stories that Ellery Queen cared that much about. But because they liked my other stories, they uh, would tolerate that, particularly <laughs> around Christmas time. Mm -hmm. That's terrific. Um, I, love. I also, I, I was also intrigued by the, uh, you've got the, um, 
the thief of Baghdad attempts to recover a flask in which the magician has imprisoned the caliph's hiccup. Yes. That's a, another Ella right. Green story? Yes, they took that one too. There was, I've had a couple of stories in Playboy, a couple of stories in uh, Alfred Hitchcock, but mostly my stories are in uh, uh, Ellery Queen. And they took that. That's because by that time, uh, the editor and I were on very good terms, and, uh, and I don't write that many stories anyway, really, so uh, I guess they figured that was a change of pace for them. When, when, when was your first it, sale? I'm sorry? When was your first sale? I was, I've been trying to track that. 67, I believe, if I recall. Mm -hmm. I can check that up, look that up right now. Well, that sounds think. about right. I, it's just, you, yeah, it's like you, you don't write that all. You, if you're writing, you don't get sales every year, uh, it seems to me. Because maybe you, uh, have you got a, like a dozen stories out there, is that right? My sort of total, to the total st stories I have right now have published is about 130. Between oh, my God. 140. I if had you no check idea. The site, there's a bibliography on the site. My April of 66, The Friends of Hector Juve. If you do four stories a year, from 1966 to now, you get about 130 stories. I wow. do what... Uh, there's a couple of years off where I wrote two novels, which were not published. Wow. That's, a, that's an impressive <laughs> catalog. I, I no wonder you can't remember the specifics on some of them. That's amazing. I, I can remember a lot of them, but uh, things are getting a little vaguer and vaguer. And uh, <laughs> I've had people tell me one of my stories, and I can't really remember that well. But then again, I realize that they're seeing it from a different perspective than I am. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And, uh, I, I hadn't listened to a dirge for Clown Town for uh, maybe five years or so. Um, mm -hmm. And when I, when I was describing it uh, to a couple of people, I, I realized that um, after re-listening to it again, uh, I noticed that um, I had described things that were not actually in it, but uh, were you know, related in a way. And it, mm -hmm. it's just such a vivid story. And it had, you know, gave me like this shock, like, you know, I read, you know, 50 stories a year. And every once in a while, one will stand out and you say, Oh, my God, this is amazing. And that's, that's what I had when I read this, uh, this uh, a dirge for clown town. And, and uh, mm -hmm. in a, in a, in a different kind of way, also, the other one I was, uh, I, I had Scott have a listen to, A Murder Coming. Um, it's not a mystery story as much as it's a, a sort of an Alfred Hitchcock style story. Yes, I, th I think you're right. I, uh, I've written a few stories like that, and uh, that was one of my favorites, although there's a mm -hmm. typo, on the, a typo in the, uh, on the first page. Um, in, uh, when it was reprinted in hardcover that oh, bothered no. me a great deal. Uh, no, no. I said he received a wire and uh, the editor wrote it down as wife. He heard as if uh, mm -hmm. it doesn't make any sense in any of that. No, it doesn't. Uh, there are all kinds of things like that that take place. By the way, The Dirge for Clown Town was my most popular story. It's been reprinted about ten times, I think. Yeah. Yeah, it's... And, it's... Uh, it's the it kind of the story award. that makes makes you stand out in the annals of history. I think, yeah. just because it's a, it's so original, so well executed. Um, Thank you. I mean, it's, it's a good. It's, it's, I'm very I'm very proud of the story, and uh, I, as I said I hope you like uh, Clown Town Pajamas. I'm looking forward uh, to reading. By the way, there is a, there uh, uh, there are also. Um, uh, Let's see, clown gauchos. Right, cool, cowboy okay. clowns. Hmm. Yeah. So there is a clown, there is a clown in that story called Gaucho. Yeah. Right. Oh. Okay. <laughs> and he has uh, a brother called Harpuno, <laughs> and another brother called Chico, I think. It was Chico something. There, all the all the clown names end in O. Not all of them do. Clown Chuckles. Uh, yeah. He is right. uh, the chauffeur for uh, Bozo. 
in that story. But uh, most, of them sound, most of them do, and you know. <clears throat> it's sad. Uh, That's neat. It must have required a lot of research. Research? Yeah. No, I, no, no, no. I, I don't know uh, that. I mean, I don't know if there I, are there. There must be books on, you know, all the different kinds of clowns and. Uh, uh, I, I mean, even the the rules for mimes. I I thought it was just like um, you you put in just like a a really good hard science fiction story. You put in a all the clues of the rules. You know, um, mm -hmm. clowns can't physically harm one another. Um, the, all, all their actions are um, uh, for a comedic effect, not for physical damage. And mm -hmm. and um, and that, like, the the best rule, I guess, you know, the the one that I that made me laugh out loud when I heard it the first time was um, uh, when the mimes um, get beat up. It's it's mime bashing is a is a crime caused by just hanging around mimes and pretending to hit them. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, um, yeah. I, I, those rules, I mean, it, it's all relentlessly logical, and yet I don't think I've ever seen that written down anywhere before. So you, you had to work all that out, and, you know, you, you, you're treating it like it's it's 100% real. You don't cheat ever. Um, no. For a cheap laugh, you're going through the rigorous... Um, logic, and yet it is hilarious. Thank you. I, mean, I enjoy it. I like the character, and uh, I really wish I had worked harder to do more stories. And as I said, I may have a third. Depends. We'll have to see what happens. Mm -hmm. I'm a slow writer, and uh, I'm afraid uh, that uh, the next Bozo story is going to have to wait for about seven or other seven or eight stories that I've got ahead of me right now. At the moment, I'm writing a Christmas story, which I generally year, do right? around Christmas time. <clears throat> yeah. Takes place well, in Toronto in 1944, the winter of 1944-45, when there was a big snowstorm. And I will recall being let off three days of school because of that grade school. And uh, I don't recall ever having been let off school for snow in Toronto before that. Sounds good. Um, I, 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 I'm also wondering. Um, I, we got, we got a uh, question from Julie. I think we got that answered, right? Um, yeah. yeah. Um, who do you like to read? Oh, who, tell who's you, your, I'm not. Mm -hmm. Who's your, um, you know, the author? You say, wow, uh, this guy's great, or she's awesome. Who do you like uh, to read? I don't read very much fiction right now. I had have in the past. Dickens was all, I always said Dickens was my favorite writer. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a little difficult to take now, but uh, uh, I don't read very much contemporary fiction. I like Borges, I like, uh, I certainly like Tolkien. I'm talking here more about the fantasy people. Sure. Uh, I just read a story by a man called uh, uh, Swanwick. Was it Swan Michael Swanwick? Michael Swanwick, yeah. Yes, The Edge of the World. I thought that was a great story. Hmm, it I had, the, had the kind of uh, logic uh, that I like to put into stories. Mm -hmm. fantasy. And uh, I thought that was a good story. I just finished reading Ian Forrester's Passage to India, and I enjoyed that very much. And uh, I was astonished that I'd never read it before. I'm at the point now where I'm trying to find space on my shelves, so I'm reading books that I haven't read in order to see whether I want to keep them or not. And, uh, <laughs> I enjoyed that one very much. Wow, I haven't read that. I've seen the movie, and I thought the movie was terrific. Uh, well, I, I liked the way the story was written, the prose, anyway, and I mm -hmm. find it, it very much like a fantasy story in a way. Oh, that sounds cool. <clears throat> mm -hmm. That's terrific. Uh, yeah, I. I I was trying to think of um, authors who you might respond to, and you know, in that in the way that I can see reflected in your your stories, and even when 
even when there's no outright humor in your stories, I still find them, in a way, kind of like a cozy story in that there's there's a um, uh, a friendly element of sort of a, uh, even even in the in the stories with sort of uh, scariness, there's still a friendly open uh, element. And I was trying to think who that might match on to. Um, and I think it's probably, you know, like one of the things I respond to is, is basically um, that. I, I found that in Donald Westlake's work as well. Are you a fan of Westlake? Uh, Westlake, sure, yes. He died last week, as you know. Mm -hmm. you may know. Yeah. Uh, we were together on a panel. Uh, at the Botrycon in Toronto a few years back, and uh, I enjoyed talking to him very much. Uh, I told I I enjoyed him for a long time. And I think you put a finger on it when you said that I resemble, in a way, his kind of uh, work. I'd Absolutely. be very happy if that was the case. I don't go in very much for violence, uh, and uh, I imagine I'm what they call a pussycat writer in the business. No, no sex and no violence, or at least not on the page, anyway. Things can right. happen off screen, so to speak. Right. Uh, in the, it's, in the, it's part of my character, I guess. That's all. Yeah, in the end of a murder coming, you've got, you've got um, a threat of violence, but it, actually, it doesn't actually happen on, on stage. No, no. Uh, yes, I recall it. I recall. He's going to... He's going to uh, uh, confront the man's wife, I think. And, uh, and yeah, uh, and even the character, yeah. he says, I'm not a violent man. Uh, I can't be violent. My wife's violent, but I'm not violent. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, that was a, it was a really nice image at the end of that story. I mean, not nice in, you know, nice in the effective sense. <laughs> yeah. Because, mm -hmm. yeah, it sure lingers with you after you're done. I think uh, you know endings are important, and uh, mm -hmm. you know how to make them. That's 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 what makes me uh, you know look forward to reading your stories. One thing about that story is that you might find interesting. Uh, I originally called it Boat Rides End. Normally, the magazine doesn't change uh, titles, but in that case, they changed it to A Murder Coming, which I was always a little uncomfortable with until I realized what they were. What Ellery Queen was, it was Frederick Dan Ale, it was one, half of the Ellery Queen team, who uh, was the editor that I dealt with. And uh, so, but you don't worry about it. Uh, it was a good enough title. Mm -hmm. But uh, a little while later, I wrote a story about Santa Claus getting uh, murdered. <laughs> and uh, mm -hmm. he shot up the chimney, as a matter of fact. Somebody shoots him up the chimney. <laughs> oh, uh, wow. So I called it Sleigh Rides End. Uh -huh. and they wouldn't touch that either. They changed it to oh. Santa's Way, I believe. Uh -huh. So uh, I still have that one title that one day I'll, I'll be able to use, I hope. <laughs> somewhere along the line. Wow. Yes, uh, uh, let's see. Santa's Way, the clue, and I do I, I like this as a clue, was the fact that the question was, was he was Santa leaving or coming down the chimney or going up when he was shot? Right. And the clue had to do with how his beard was positioned. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Where did that story appear? That was Ellery Queen, too. Okay. I'm going to look that one up. Uh, there was one story that didn't appear in Ellery Queen. It appeared in uh, one of Peter Sellers' collections, and it was called The Tamerlane Crutch. And it's a takeoff on uh, the Maltese Falcon. And uh, how did how did that begin? Marley was dead. That was the beginning. Yes. <laughs> and uh, it's Marley's partner talking, obviously Scrooge. Yes, right. Uh, his partner has been killed, and you don't let somebody kill your partner without doing something about it. <laughs> <laughs> awesome, awesome. So yeah, we but can see. Uh, we can see various influences there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The, uh, <clears throat> there was a good clue in there that I'm very proud of, too. Mm -hmm. uh, someone is trying to locate Scrooge, and uh, they finally 
They know Marley, so they recognize Marley's face on the door knocker. And they know that's Scrooge's house. Uh, if you recall, yeah. uh, the door Marley's uh, the door knocker becomes Marley's face mm -hmm. when Scrooge is coming home at night. Right. Uh, <laughs> that's nice. That's true. That's true. Mm -hmm. All right, that's cool. Um, I I want to I want to ask you um, uh, what about um, uh, Lawrence Block? Um, Lawrence Block and Donald Westlake don't exactly have the same style of writing, but I those are also uh, he's also another author. I, yeah. I don't read that much mystery. I read more um, science fiction and fantasy. But if mm -hmm. Lawrence Block wrote it, if James Powell wrote it, Donald Westlake wrote it. Uh, if Jim Thompson wrote it, I'm there. But I wouldn't class yes. you in with Jim Thompson. I'd class you in with more Lawrence Block and Donald Westlake. Yes, I, I'd be happy to be in that company. Uh, I like Block. I met him <laughs> at, uh, at about your con again. Uh, and, uh, uh, he doesn't he, write that much short fiction anymore? But, no, he uh, doesn't. He, uh, it's, it's more novels. It's something but, that you're either... You're either uh, uh, well, what can I say? I found it to be a very comfortable form, so that's why I write in it. And also my old, my longer stuff seems to uh, uh, collapse under its own weight, I guess you'd say. Although I like it, but uh, uh, I haven't found anybody else it does. So, so um, I like his uh, short work, but he doesn't do very much of it anymore. And neither did Winslick, as far as I... No, oh. no, he hasn't, he hadn't done anything... Um, but his novels are never that long, either. No, they generally were pretty short. I, I think maybe you've got one one or two 500-page books, but mostly it's yeah. 300s or so. Um, but yeah, they, only, they... Oh, sorry. No, no, I was going to say, uh, I only have one story that I wished I had writ tried to write as a novel rather than as a short story, but... Uh, um, I don't know if I would have accomplished what I wanted to do with it. Well, I, 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 I know that the, the short story form is not popular, not compared to novels. Novels are what everybody, you know, cares about, it seems. Mm -hmm. But short stories for me are, short stories and novellas are, I think, the best size for fiction. Just because you can pack in a lot of ideas into a short space mm -hmm. and the best short stories are better than the best novels the, I, the best novels are as that. good as some of the sh you know mm -hmm. some short stories but not the yeah. other way around that's yeah. the way I, I feel think, anyways I wouldn't disagree with that mm -hmm. yeah I agree as well <laughs> the, uh, at least uh, I can load a great deal into a short story because at least the the uh, reader can look ahead and say, well, there's going to be too much more of this anyway, so... <laughs> got to get through it. It's so, so yeah. hard. I hope it ends soon now. Yeah. <laughs> That's usually the way I feel. Mm -hmm. I, I, it's more along the lines of... Um, it's like, uh, show me something interesting. Um, you're showing me, you're showing me. Wow! Amazing. <laughs> and mm -hmm. the, the, you know... The meaning of every word, the placement of every word is important. Um, you, with a novel, especially today, uh, the length seems to be uh, commensurate with, you know, how popular it is. If it's a popular novel, it's really, really long. But yeah. I'm not sure why that... I, I don't know who that person is that's reading the long ones and saying, I've got to make it longer! Because <laughs> I'm, I'm along the lines of, if it's yeah. shorter, yeah. it's probably better. <laughs> it's, it's funny that uh, when when I go over stories, now I, I I do go over them again and again. Uh, it's generally trying to shorten them. Right. Uh, Take a word out I think here it, or there. it adds attention. You know, it's, it's like uh, you're winding it up and you're getting attention going. Uh, yeah. And I'd rather say it in one word rather than three. Um, let's see now. What was I? I had something I wanted to add. Oh, well, I did write a story recently for uh, Fantasy and uh, what is it? Fantasy and Science FNSF, Fiction magazine, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. called uh, "The Quest for Creeping Charlie." Mm. 
and uh, that was based on a line that I came across in one of uh, George Orwell's essays. And uh, in the essay, George Orwell is talking about hunting, uh, the Englishman's attitude towards hunting and towards animals in general. And he said, uh, a wise man was asked, what is the smartest animal? And he replied, the one that man hasn't found yet. <laughs> so I decided to uh, write a story based on that. A man who sets out to find this animal, which he calls Creeping Charlie. And he believes it's an urban animal and it's smart enough that it won't let man, man find them because they would probably destroy him. Uh, they're curious good. enough that they want to watch people at the same time. Now this is placed in FNSF, so is it science fiction or fantasy? Oh, I'd be it's fantasy. I don't, uh, but I don't have to, all I have to do is write it. I don't have to <laughs> put a label on it. <laughs> Well, I gotta tell you, if you wrote it, it's probably hard fantasy if it's if it's yeah. fantasy. <laughs> Thank you. Um. The, uh, what is it? Let's see. Um, it appeared in the January 08 issue. Oh, okay. So it the takes place in Toronto in 19, 1950 or 55. The subway system was being built at that time. It's not a very long story, and. Uh, but if you do get a chance to read it, I hope you enjoy it. Hmm. Well, I'm, I'm going to track that one down. I, I, I'm i curious. It's, it seems to me then when the stories are um, set on Earth, <laughs> they tend to be mm -hmm. uh, uh, set in Canada. Have you written any stories set in the U.S.? Even though uh, you li you're Canadian, you live in the United States. So I'm just wondering if... Yeah. if uh, yes, I have... Um, I have uh, several, as a matter of fact, though I can't think of one specifically, but uh, there was one called uh, uh, Christmas, what did I call it, Christmas Hiatus. Um, it, it's a man living in, uh, living in New York. Uh, see, I'm starting, I'm starting to forget, when you start forgetting your own stories, <laughs> uh, serious trouble. It's time for a new well, it, collection. That's it, sounds like, it sounds like you need to collect your Christmas stories. Yeah. I could, yes. That I would, be, that would be neat. That's not something you see very often. Yeah. No, I wish uh, I had in inquired around, and uh, uh, things are so bad right now that uh, there isn't much of a chance. Although there is an editor at, uh, on one of the book uh, on demand series who I think would like a collection. Uh huh. I may, I may try to do yeah, that. That'd be terrific. Winter hiatus, that's it. Mm hmm. And it was in Iced, the new noir anthology of cold heart fiction, Peter Sellers and uh, Terry J. Schooley. Well, that sounds good. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I have a number of series, as I said, the Ganelons, and uh, uh, a number of series that didn't really come to, very, to fruition because uh, they were hard to do in a short story form. My hero, Captain Sunset was the champion of the elderly and uh, he was actually uh, an organization of elderly people who have came up with one man to represent themselves as a and put him in a cape and that sort of thing and, and, uh, <laughs> that's terrific I wrote a couple of stories about him and I wrote another couple of stories about a two uh, a man and woman he was a Canadian she's an American and she writes children's stories and uh, together they solve crimes that takes place in the United States he is teaching Canadian American literature at uh, a small college in Pennsylvania boy that that one doesn't sound uh, I, don't, I don't know where you could have got the idea for that one it's just <laughs> so but, out uh, there <laughs> uh, uh, that story, each story begins with the ending of one of the mystery stories that she's written Oh. And then it ends with the start of her next mystery story. <laughs> so the fact that I, I intended to do a sort of a round robin of them, but I only did about four. Oh, wow. And then I started on one that it, so that once you were done, you'd have the whole cycle of stories, beginnings and ends. But uh, I'm, I'm not describing that quite well. But no, I, I think, got bogged I think down I on that. So. It's like a Mobius loop in a way, right? 
Yeah. Mm hmm. Oh. So, yeah, you would definitely know where the series, uh, what's included in the series, but you wouldn't know where the beginning was or where the end was. No, that's right. Yeah. That sounds great. Now, the yeah, last I... story, I guess you'd start at the first, with the first story, and the last story would give you the beginning of the, uh, the, the last story would end with the beginning uh, of the story that would end in the first story. So, <laughs> as I said, it right. was like a, a round robin. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Makes sense. Well, mm -hmm. thanks, thanks very much, James. It's a pleasure. Uh, I've I enjoyed talking to both of you. Yeah, it was definitely my pleasure to be introduced to you. So, uh, judging from those two stories, I mean, oh, they were wonderful stories. Thank um, you. You're very welcome. Looking forward um, to more. That clown town, you know, I, I urge people. To, I urge people to find that. Now, you found that on audio, right? Yeah. And uh, in a where, where was that? It's in an out-of-print collection called The Best Fantasy Stories of the Year, 1989, which is a collection of uh, stories by Orson Scott Card and Martin H. Greenberg. Uh, and each story in the collection is introduced by Orson Scott Card. Okay. And uh, that, that's not on Audible or anything, right? It's just an out-of-print cassette? It's not on Audible. It should be on Audible. Mm -hmm. But, yeah, it's, it's out-of-print. Um, Let's see if I've got an ISBN for it. Uh, okay. No, I don't. But right. I'll see if I can track that down. Well, quick. yeah, what I, what I just wanted to say, I, I really, you know, I, I remember being on a panel at a, at a convention one time, and, and people were talking about the difficulty of um, science fiction mysteries. You know, mm -hmm. I'll, lump, I'll lump fantasy in there, too. The, the whole idea was, hey, you know, you know f mysteries are hard enough you know, for uh, a person to follow and, and for a, a person to enjoy in in the world that they know, you know. Mm -hmm. So now if you if you toss in a world that they don't know, then um, you've added a whole layer of complication. I, I think, you know, gosh, I, I should probably verify this, but I'm going to say it anyway, but I'm pretty sure that uh, uh, John Campbell Jr. is quoted as saying that he felt that that just wasn't possible to write good stories as uh you know mysteries you know and then isaac asimov started doing them yeah um but but a lot of uh you know um well heck his robot stories are all mysteries so maybe i'm up in the night there but but anyway my point is is that a, a dirge uh for clown town is one of the finest mysteries i've ever read set in a in a different world you know it um, is it, it's not an easy thing to do um, it can't be, um, but I, I urge you to, I urge everyone who's listening to try and find that and check it out. Yeah, I, I wish it was available, um, on audio, um, um, today. Uh, we'll see, I'll see if we can't find somebody to, um, uh, re-release it. Mm -hmm. Um, I, the narrator on the, uh, the Durkham collection is, is good, but, mm -hmm. um, I don't. I don't think tracking down the rights uh, from Durkham would be very easy. So well, maybe we can get um, put the word out that we want this uh, terrific, terrific story um, audioed, and maybe somebody will take up the cause and record it and mm -hmm. make everyone happy. Um, I, I think. I think basically what we need is a new James Powell uh, collection out there. Mm -hmm. um, because everything I've read of his uh, has made me go, this is this is a guy who's got everything going for his writing, because he doesn't cheat. He cares mostly about story. He carries mostly he carries he cares mostly about making the story as good as it can be. And now, not all ideas are equal, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, I just I just finished um, listening to uh, a novel called. Um, the Book of Lies, mm -hmm. and uh, it, it takes two premises. It takes the idea of the Cain and Abel story, and the real life creation of Superman by Jerry Siegel. <laughs> it takes those mm -hmm. two ideas, puts it together. Um, I think this is the best possible novel 
of those two ideas together that there could be. However, uh-huh. those two ideas are not the greatest two ideas ever. So um, when when they're put together, it's it's a good it's good writing. But what James Powell seems to have done is he he cares mostly. He gets one central tiny idea and then expands it out. Right? What we heard in the interview, he he was talking about the 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 in, friends of Inspector Jouvet when he was. Um, <laughs> in um, Monte Carlo, right? He heard mm-hmm. about the police whose job it is just to give a, uh, a train ticket to the people who've lost all their money so they, they get out of town. You know, it, uh-huh. it, it sounds like a, the nub of a great story idea. Um, the um, uh, Dirge for Clown Town, it says, uh, I've got a, a, a world in which everyone is a clown. Mm-hmm. Um, how can I make a mystery out of that? And he does it. And you say, I mean, I, I don't see there's a word placed wrong, right? There isn't a false note anywhere. Uh-huh. And even in, you know, uh, the other one you heard, uh, A Murder Coming, um, it's it's not as outrageous. There's nothing really outrageous in, in any of the setups. It's not, it's not fantastic in any way. Um, you, you know, there's no mystery. Uh, there's no magic. There's no, um, you know... Uh, real, there, there's not even a mystery, really. I mean, there's a twist, but it's all relentlessly logical from the central core idea, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and he even he even tips his hand, saying, you know, um, I've seen this in movies before, where the the man who who has um, uh, been convicted of a of a murder um, gets out of jail and proves that his uh, his um, the person he murdered wasn't murdered after all. They're still alive, right? He uh-huh. even tips his hand in the story, and so you think you know where it's going, but it doesn't go there. It goes somewhere else, relentlessly logical, um, and I think that that just makes him a great writer. Mm-hmm. So great. We'll, okay. We'll see if we can't uh, get some audio out there of uh, some more audio out there from. James Powell. The, a Murder Coming can be found in a Durkin Hayes collection, um, a very small collection of three stories. Um, uh, ISBN number is 0886466377. All right. Read by Jory, uh, Jerry Orbach, late Jerry Orbach from Law & Order. This has been the SFF Audio Podcast. Please join us at www.sffaudio.com.